Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we'll be speaking tonight from the book of Revelation. We're going to be in the 14th chapter. Now you say, well, preacher, are you doing Sunday morning preaching on Revelation? Yes, but I'm, I'm really bored. I want to get back in chapter 14. Amen. We don't want you to be bored. If you don't mind, turn me up a little bit. I, my ears are still stopped up. But anyway, um, and we don't want my ears stopped up, and we certainly want yours exposed to the Word of God. Amen. Revelation chapter 14. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to share two verses with you. We will be in chapter 14 Sunday morning, and we'll be in more detail this coming Sunday morning in chapter 14 of Revelation. But tonight, I just want to do some preaching. Amen. Praise God. Verse 12 and 13 of Revelation 14. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write unto me, or say unto me, write. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yes, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. I want to use for a subject tonight, dying in the Lord. You may be seated. Dying in the Lord. Everywhere we look, there is the evidence of death. No matter where you go, there is the evidence of death. If you came from Sparta, you, you passed by about three or four graveyards. If you came from Springfield, you passed by four or five graveyards, dep depending on whether you're from the north part of Springfield or the south. If you came from Seymour, you came from a graveyard. <laughs> well, several graveyards, amen. If you came from Bruner, you came from more graveyard. And unless you just came across the street, you passed by at least one graveyard. And many of you went by many graveyards on the way to get here. I'm glad the graveyard is not our final destination. Hello. That's a good place to shout amen. I'm glad the graveyard is not our final destination. For Jesus Christ has brought us victory through his resurrection. I'm glad we got a God that got up after he was beaten down. I'm glad we got a God that got up after he was crucified. I'm glad we got a God that got up after death came over him. I'm glad we got a God that always gets up and he'll get us up and take us home by his power and by his grace. Amen. Dying in the Lord. I, um, I look at this and I, and I realize that this is in the midst of the great tribulation period. I realize that this 14th chapter is a parenthetical chapter. It's kind of a flash forward to tell the troubled saints in the great tribulation that Jesus Christ has got this. He's got it covered. It's going to be all right. And so the 14th chapter is a flash forward. It's a parenthetical chapter, meaning that you don't follow it like you would read an ordinary book. You just see that inserted in the middle of the revelation, chapter 14, God says, blessed are they who die in the Lord. Now, there are blessings in the book of Revelation. In fact, there are seven Beatitudes in the book of Revelation. There, this chapter 14, verse um, uh, 13, is the second Beatitude in the book of Revelation. The first one is in chapter uh, 1, verse 3, blessed are they that hear, read the Scripture, they hear the Word of God. Blessed is he that readeth and they that Hear it the words of this prophecy and keepeth those things which are written in therein for the time is at hand. That's on the screen, so I cheated a little bit. And this is the second blessing here in verse 13 of Revelation 14. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, the spirit, that they may rest from their labors 
and their works do follow them. I'm going to correct some things in just a little bit about that phrase because so many of us just misinterpret that altogether. But I want you to notice in chapter 16, verse 15, we find another beatitude or a blessed. It says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and see his shame. How many know it's a beautiful, blessed, exciting beatitude or blessing from the Lord that he could show up at any moment? That's a blessing. I said, that's a blessing. That's encouragement. That's great encouragement. 16 verse 15. That is a beautiful beatitude. There's another beatitude in chapter 19 verse 9. In chapter 19, verse 9, says, And he saith unto me, Right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, Right, or saith unto me, These are true sayings of God. Now here, the marriage supper of the Lamb, those that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb, this is not the bride, this is not the church. It's his guests that are going to be presented and will be there at this great wedding feast that the bride will have, that Jesus Christ will give to us during that great wedding day. Chapter 20, verse 6, we see another beatitude. And it says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. I love that. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So we have the blessed truth that there is going to come a first resurrection. And blessed is he that takes part in the first resurrection. I plan on getting involved in that one. I mean plan on getting involved in that one. And now the first resurrection is not just the rapture. The first resurrection is a harvest meaning there, there'll be the rapture, the catching away of the church, then there'll be others that are gathered together in the great tribulation, then at the end of that uh, great tribulation time, there'll be the millennium, and there'll be those that are gathered together, so that is the first resurrection. Um, it's kind of like a garden, you have your first harvest, you know, those first ripe tomatoes, and then you have the second little harvest, and then you are inundated and covered with tomatoes. And you're almost to the place where you're encouraged or have evil thoughts to bring them to church and throw them at your preacher. <laughs> Judy has canned tomato soup like crazy. And uh, she has a lot of tomatoes. Then there's the fall harvest where the tomatoes will just kind of hang on. And that's when a, a lot of these poor folks that don't know what's good and what's bad in the area of food, that's when they fry green tomatoes. Now, some people do that in the early spring, which is a crime. It's a dirty, rotten shame and crime. But to pick a few green tomatoes before the frost, I can see that. All right, I'll pass that by. But there is the cleaning. There is the time. So the harvest is blessed is he that has part in the first resurrection. That takes in all the good harvest. And then there's the bad harvest that will come after that. But notice it says here in chapter 20, um, 22, verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of this prophecy of this book. I love that. I come quickly. It says, blessed is he, or behold, I come quickly. I like that phrase. Jesus Christ is coming quickly. Amen. Now, I don't mean he'll get here before sundown. It just means when he shows up, sundown won't matter because he'll beat everything. Amen? Amen? I mean, the Lord could come in, the Lord could come 25 times within a, a, a 50th of a second. He's not going to. He's going to come once. I'm going on the first load. I mean, going on the first load. Amen. Amen. And the Lord's not going to say after he gets a good load to take us home, well, you got to get out. We're overloaded. Amen. Amen. The only way you're going to be rejected is you're overloaded with sin. And then there's the last beatitude. 
And that is found in 22, Revelation, verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. For without it are dogs, verse 15, sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, and whosoever maketh a lie. In other words, no liar is going to get inside. No whoremonger is going to get inside. It is reserved for the blood washed and the redeemed of Christian that's going to go to heaven. No sinner will be able to go into that holy city for it is reserved for those that have been purchased, purged, redeemed by the blood of the lamb. So unless you didn't catch the seven beatitudes of verse one of chapter one, verse three of chapter 14, verse six of chapter 20, Verse 7 of chapter 22, uh, verse nine, uh, chapter 19, verse 9, 16, verse 15, and 22, verse 14. There, there are your seven Beatitudes of the book of Revelation. But we're going to look at the second Beatitude, which is found here in the 14th chapter, verse 13. This Beatitude is misunderstood by a lot of people. I want everybody to understand something. Death is not your friend. Death is never your friend. A lot of people try to say, well, make peace with death. I beg your pardon. I am not making peace with death. I'm going to make peace with God, and then death don't matter. But I am not going to make peace with death because it is a murderer. Death is a, is a killer, and I'm not going to submit myself to death. Jesus did that, so I don't have to. And so I'm going to be in the Lord, not just in death. Amen. The Bible says in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26, the last enemy that shall be destroyed is what? Death. So see, I, I was very scriptural when I told you that I'm not going to make friends with my enemy. I am not going to make friends with death. I hear preachers say all the time, well, make friends with death. Why would I want to make friends with someone that kills my loved ones? Why would I want to make friends with someone who killed my Jesus on the cross? Why would I want to make friends with something that sin brought into the world, death, and, and death but sin? And why would I ever want to glorify death? I want to glorify Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to get into some heavy stuff to, today. And I want to begin by saying in verse 12, it says, here is the patience of the saints. Now, the patience of the saints simply means the ability to hang on. Patience of the saints means the strength to not let go. Patience of the saints is one that has been redeemed and he has a claw on inside of him that hangs on to the virtues of God that is outside of his own power. The patience of the saints is the power of God. Inside of every child of God is the power of God, amen? God's people persevere. We as children of God, we persevere. You say, well, what does persevere mean? Meaning no matter what we face in life, we will overcome and persevere because there's a God who lives inside of us as Christians. Christians hurt. Christians suffer. Christians go through hard times. Christians face difficulties. Christians face pain and sickness and disease. Christians go through the fire. Christians go through hard times. But Christians do not lose because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Christians always overcome because the overcomer lives inside of us. The last verse of John 16, verse 33 says that in the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, Jesus Christ said, I have overcome the world. 
Now, that means we've got something to shout about even if we're bumming out ourselves. Now, you may bum out, but Jesus won't bum out. You may fall flat, but Jesus don't fall flat. And you can always trust your Jesus. And it says, here is the patience of the saints. Now, I don't want to make light of the high pressure that the saints in the great tribulation are going through. Because we are like at a, we're, 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 we're just like at a Sunday school picnic compared to what is going to happen. The pressures that we have, the tribulations that we have, don't compare to what will happen during the great tribulation. So I'm not making light of the great pressures that they're under. But we do possess power in our life. And we possess eternal life inside of us as children of God. And the Bible says, here is patience of the saints. Now, I do believe (coughs) that it's coming soon, that it's going to get more difficult. It's going to get harder. It's going to get more um, painful in life. We're going to struggle. Christians go through hard times. And I believe hard times are going to come at our nation like an avalanche. I believe that it's not going to get better, but it's going to get worse. But notice that God is saying to them in this 14th chapter, verse 12, that, hold on, here's the patience of the saints. Here is the, the um, perseverance of the saints, the, the stick-to-ism, the hang-on-ism. Now, how many in this ever, room ever felt like just giving up? Anybody ever just felt like giving up? Just felt like, oh, you know, I just can't make it. I, I just give up. Well, you're still here, aren't you? You're still in church, aren't you? You're just not a, get, you're just not a good giver-upper. You're lousy at giving up. Amen? Why? Because Jesus lives inside of you. I'm lousy at giving up. I, Jesus lives inside of me. Amen? And so he says, here's the perseverance of the saints. And what gives them that perseverance is, and I want to point out, first of all, the patience, number one, the patience. Number two, the faith of Jesus. Notice I talked about the patience and the faith of Jesus Christ. Notice the scripture does not say the faith of James Akins. Notice the scripture does not say the faith of you. Notice the scripture does not say the faith of brother whoever, sister whoever. It says the faith of Jesus. Now, the Bible's very clear that if we have saving faith, it's given to us by the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible is very clear that if we have faith, you can't even brag about that because God gives us the faith of Jesus. Amen? I'm glad I've got the faith of Jesus. <clears throat> There's way too much pushing and advocating our ability to believe or faith. And, and I realize Jesus Christ says, have faith in God and believe. But we under, need to understand that our laying hold of God and our having faith in God is a product of Jesus in us. Whatsoever is born of God, it says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5, overcometh the world. And this is the victory of him that overcometh the world, even our faith. Our faith what? Our faith in Jesus Christ. Even our faith in Jesus Christ. We overcome the world because of our faith in Jesus Christ. The faith of Jesus Christ. Now, let me stop right here. Faith cannot be killed. The f- true faith of Jesus Christ cannot be killed. Not only can the true faith of Jesus Christ not be killed, but the fires of the faith of Jesus Christ cannot be extinguished. Now, the fire may get lower. The Embers may get quieter. It may look like there's no fire there. But when you pray to Jesus Christ, 
I said, when you pray to Jesus Christ, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles. He will answer by and by. He will hear our faintest cry. And when we feel a little prayer wheel turning, then we know a fire is burning. And just a little talk with Jesus makes things right. So our faith will always accelerate once we get our focus again in our life. Now, I can tell my voice is starting to wane a little bit, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to slow down just a little bit so we can see this. The faith of Jesus Christ cannot be killed, nor can the fires of Jesus Christ be extinguished. Dying in the Lord. Now, let me, let me just purpose by saying this. Our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, you may, let me just stop right here and say, you may die in a pool of blood. You may die in twisted steel. You may die in sickness and disease. You may die in pain. You may die with a troubled mind. You may die with a trembling heart. You may die with regret. You may die with great heartbreak and great fear. But if you die in Christ, you'll still go to heaven. If you die in Christ, you'll still go to heaven. The one place you don't want to die is in sin. Amen? You don't want to die in sin. You want to die in Christ. Now, you can die in fear. You can die in doubt. You can die in, uh, in tribulation. You can die in sadness. You can die with with weakness of the mind. You can die with depressed soul, discouraged spirit. You can die in various ways and still go to heaven if you're in Christ. But you cannot die with a habitual sinful nature and go to heaven. You cannot die with a resentment toward God and a hate and an unbelief toward God and go to heaven. You can't. You'll go to hell. Now notice in this verse, and I want to, th these are some really <clears throat> good stuff. Verse um, 13, I heard a voice from heaven. I wonder whose voice that is. Probably the same voice that spoke to John on the Isle of Patmos when he said, what the things you see write in a book, that voice was Jesus Christ. And so I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, right, no doubt this is Jesus speaking. <clears throat> Jesus Christ says, blessed or happy are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. So where you die is very important. I don't mean by <clears throat> where you die in a car or where you die in a hospital bed or where you die at home. That's, that, that's not important at all. But where you die spiritually, <clears throat> you, you must die in the Lord. Because if you don't die in the Lord, you're going to die without the Lord. And without the Lord, you're not going to make it. Amen? I, uh, you know, we, we have storms, we have trials, we have hard times. But we need to understand that our love for Christ will take us through. <clears throat> Let me point out here again in verse 13. The Spirit is speaking, saith the Spirit, that they from rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Now, let, you know, I've always read this verse 13. I've always looked at it. And I thought, you know, we're looking at their labors and their works. <clears throat> let me begin by saying that your labors and your works are not the same. They're not the same. Read that verse again. Notice that verse says that they may rest from what? Their labors. <coughs> and their works should do what? Follow them. So their labor and their works is not the same. Their works is their testimony in Christ. Their works is their gratitude to the Lord. 
Their works is their dedication to God. Their works is their prayer life. Their works is their giving of alms and helping others. Their works is their dedication to the Lord. Their works is their honoring God. That's their works. But their labor is not their works. Notice it says they'll rest from their labors. Rest from their labors. Now let me real quickly say this. The only thing that rests when you die is your body. Your body rests when you die. So we know by this scripture that if you rest in your body, and let me say real quickly, uh, and I don't have to say this quickly for it to be so, by the way, but, you know, no one really rests. When a grandfather dies, the grandchildren don't rest. When a husband dies, the, the, the wife don't rest. When, when a mother has a child die, that mother don't rest. The body of that individual rests, but the family don't rest because death has no rest except to the one who falls asleep in Jesus Christ. And so we need to understand that the labor here is connected to their body. Their labor here is connected to their life here on earth. A lot of people like to put this labor and work together. That's not what the scripture is saying. The scripture is saying your works follow you, meaning God will reward you for the things you do deliberately for the Lord. But along the way, you're going to have labors. Labors. You say, well, what, what are you talking about by labors? Well, I'm talking about the labors of life. I'm talking about the labors of, of hard times. I'm talking about the labors of, of storms, the labors of, uh, of fear and hurts. No more labor. Animals labor. Earth labors. Trees and flowers labor. Babies labor. Children labor. Mothers labor. Fathers labor. Man labors. We live in a world where we labor under the deep attacks of storms and regrets and sorrows. We labor. Life is a struggle. We came out of our mother's womb in a struggle. Making a living is a struggle. Getting by in life is a struggle. Dealing with old age is a struggle. Let me stop right now. Old age isn't for sissies. Old age is not glamorous. Old age is a bummer. But in old age, we labor. In trying to make a living, we labor. Many people labor with mental issues. They struggle in their mind. From a child, they've had mental issues. I don't mean that they're, they're insane. I just mean that there's mental issues in their mind that they labor with. There are people that labor in their mind. There's people that labor in their heart. There's people that labor in their relationship with God because they feel the guilt of their past. There's people that labor in, the, in their, their walk with God because they feel inadequate. Well, welcome to the crowd. But there's people that labor in that. And that's why the Bible says that we can enter into his rest. And so many people need to learn to enter into his rest, not our rest. The only way you're ever going to have perfect rest is for your body to die. In the Lord. Amen? I know. This, this is something that you probably wasn't planning on to hear tonight, but their labor and their works, their works follow them. And, and I just wanted everybody to know tonight that life is full of labor. Everything labors. We can die in a storm. We can die in regret. We can die in defeat and still go to heaven. 
if we die in Christ. So, bless God, I don't think you'll be defeated. I've met way too many people that have Christ in their life, but they don't measure up to where they need to be. That's just a fact. And you know, I, I don't pastor a church full of super saints. You know, and if I did, I'd probably have to find another church to pastor because I'm not a super preacher. But we, we face problems. We face disease. We face sickness. We face trials. That's what he means by labors. They shall rest from their labor. Now, in their case, great tribulation saints, this is not church saints. This is, the church is already with the Lord in heaven. But this is people that saved during the great tribulation. They have much more pressure than you and I could ever begin to imagine. Because they can't buy or sell. They can't do anything without the mark of the beast. They, they're, they're under great persecution. They're, in fact, there's not probably any pastors that are pastoring flocks. If they are, they're very small flocks because they don't pastor a church because there's no church. The church is in heaven. But there'll be people that will be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And the Bible says, blessed are the dead that die henceforth on. He's talking about the great tribulation. Those that die, they'll rest in their labor. They'll rest. Their body will go to sleep in Christ. They will come alive and stand in the presence of the Lamb. They will leave and vacate their body, and their body will experience rest, and their labor, cease from labor, and, they, and their works will follow them. And I, I don't want to make light of the tribulation saints when I go to talking about our storms and our trials and our problems, <coughs> because we can't even begin to imagine just how much pressure will be in the great tribulation on people. But think about it, no more labor, no more struggle, no more pressure, no more storms that are beating, no more headache of despair, no more fear of, of, of attack, no more anxiety, no more deep depression, no more obsession, no more pressure. Why? Because when you die in the Lord, all that is over with. All that is gone. Can God deal with some of that before you die? Of course he can. And of course we should allow him to do so. But just because you're struggling with something doesn't make you a second class Christian. If you're struggling with a problem in your life, you are not seconds. You're first. Your top, bona fide, genuine, glorified, Holy Ghost machines. And just because maybe you are struggling with something does not mean that you are inadequate or, well, of course, everybody's inadequate, but it doesn't mean that you don't measure up to anybody else. First of all, throwing stones is easy. They're laying on the ground everywhere. But we have no need to throw stones at each other. And, you know, it'd be really a chore to throw them at yourself and really kind of stupid on top of that. But there are so many people that understand that we are under pressure and it's going to get worse. The pressure is going to get worse. The closer we come to the time, the devil will try to wear out the saints. When Daniel talks about wearing out the saints, he's not talking about you and me, talking about those in the great tribulation. He'll try to wear out the saints. I don't know why everybody tries so hard to put the church in the great tribulation because it just, it's almost like they want the devil beat out of all of us. Amen? Now, first of all, you can't beat the devil out of anybody. Jesus Christ has to move inside and the devil goes. Amen? I've tried to beat the devil out of a few people. It don't work. When you beat the devil out of people, and I tried when I first got saved, I tried beating the devil out of a couple of guys, and I ended up, well, it just didn't work, and the Lord told me, boy, weren't you glorious just a moment ago. 
And I had to deal with that. But there is the, no more pressure. No more, the Bible calls it, uh, works follow us. But the Bible, the Bible is very clear that this, this, this uh, labor that we have, and the same words like laboring to bear a, a child, as a woman bears a child, labor. We're all facing labor. Everybody's been in labor, and you've been in labor a whole lot longer than nine months. We all are in labor. Labor in our mind, labor in our heart, labor in our walk with God. We're in labor. The whole world is under labor. The animal kingdom is, uh, is laboring. The, the plant life is laboring. The world is laboring. And the only thing that's going to stand in that last day is our works, which follow us to the throne room of God. Isn't that beautiful? Now, let me just quickly say from my heart tonight, if you have the faith of Jesus Christ in your heart, if it's true, genuine, saving faith, it cannot be killed. And if you have the true fire of the faith of God in your heart, it cannot be put out. Now, it may simmer. It may get to the place where it looks like it's almost gone. But that fire will rage back. God will keep his people. There's a 144,000 uh, 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 Jews preaching the gospel. And, and we find in this 14th chapter, they're still alive because they've been sealed with their father's name. God has sealed them. 144,000 Jews, preachers of the gospel, they're on Mount Zion, and there they are in this chapter 14, and they're still alive because the Father has put his name on their forehead. They're not dead because God is taking care of them, amen? Someone says, well, you know, the 144,000, that's not really 144,000, that's just a big number. Well, in my bank account, that's not a big number. Someone says, well, the 144,000 is just a picture of all the saints over time. Those are people that believe in, in um, uh, replacement theology. They don't believe Israel is involved in the end time. Those are people who believe they don't believe in, well, actually, they believe in amillennialism. They don't believe in a millennial reign. They, they have totally voided themselves of the fact that God actually might call 12,000 Jews out of each tribe and make them evangelists. <clears throat> and so there's a people like that. And I guess my question is this. Why not 200,000? If you believe it's just a big number, it just illustrates a, you know, a big number, why not 200,000? <clears> why not a, Why not 1,000? If it's just going to be a big number, why not just use it? There'll be a zillion. If we're going to look out, why don't we just use the term 100, like 100%? Why does it, why did it say 144,000? Because there's 12,000 out of each tribe of Israel. Do the math. 12,000 times 12 is 144,000. Amen. And notice they're at Mount Zion, they're protected, they're ready, they're, they're still alive. And it's not 143,999. It's the full 144,000. Isn't that good? I, I was going to share that Sunday morning, but I know there's some folks in this room right now saying, man, I've been needing to hear this. You know, because some, some, somebody has tried to tell you or you've heard from someone saying, well, that's just a big number that just symbolizes the future. And uh, no, there's going to be 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel that's going to preach the gospel. But I love this. I love this fact that death 
will take us into the presence of God, but it won't be death as our friend. True faith cannot be killed. The fires of faith cannot be extinguished. The nature of saving faith is to overcome. I'm going to overcome. You're going to overcome. You may go to heaven nervous, but you'll go to heaven. If you put your trust in Jesus Christ. Now, you can't die in habitual sin. You can't die in a nature and habitual anger and opposition to God. But if you want to go to heaven, I got some good news. You can go. And it has nothing to do with your strength. It has everything to do with the strength of Jesus Christ. I got news for you. If you want to go to heaven, you can go there. No matter what faces in your life, if you will honestly, with a sincere heart, bow at the feet of the sovereign God of the universe and repent of your sins and call out to God and let the Spirit of God lead you as He wants to lead you in your walk with Him, you can go to heaven and no devil in hell can stop that. Amen. 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 That's good stuff. Amen. Who is speaking here? Jesus Christ. Right. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. From henceforth their labors ceases. They rest. I am so grateful for the fact that God didn't give me a bunch of do's and don'ts and say, now you keep them just, just right and then you can go to heaven. I'm so grateful that God saw that I was pretty pathetic. And he came to the cross and he took my patheticness and he died on the cross of Calvary to save my soul. Amen? Hello. Got one more place. I know, I know I'm preaching a little long, but that's all right. If Chuck was here, he'd say, do it again. Chris would too. Uh, go to Philippians real quickly. This is one of my favorite parts of the Scripture. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. But Jesus made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. It does not say that Jesus appreciated death says he became obedient to it. He despised the shame. He despised what was happening according to Isaiah 53. Jesus despised the shame. He, being found in the likeness of man, Jesus Christ went to the cross of Calvary. And Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, the sovereign God of everything that is that was, that ever shall be the creator of all things. That God humbled himself at the feet of death and said, I'm going to die so that James Akins can live forever. I'm going to die so you can live forever. Isn't that beautiful? I'm going to die on the cross. I'm going to shed my blood for your sin. I'm going to hu humiliate myself at the feet of death. The last enemy will be destroyed. It is an enemy. Death couldn't even kill Jesus, but Jesus allowed him to, to do his work. Isn't that great? Jesus couldn't even be killed. 
I mean, the Roman soldiers beat him and spit upon him and put crowns of thorns on his head and beat him till his intestines fell out of his body and, and they put nails in his hands and his feet and they, they beat him to such a, such a massacre that he didn't even resemble a, a human being or even an animal. There on the cross, he took, and he still couldn't die. Why? Because he's life. Amen. Jesus Christ was life. He couldn't die until Jesus Christ said to his father, it is finished. And then he yielded his spirit into the hands of God. And then they put him in a grave. They put Jesus Christ in the grave. I, th I think it was Peter who said the, the, that Jesus could not be holden by the grave. I love that King James phrase, all he could not be holding by the grave. <laughs> I like that word, holding. Yeah, the devil's holding him, holding him, hold him down. Don't get him up, don't let him up, hold him down. And Peter said, no, the grave couldn't hold him. Because it was not possible for the grave to hold the prince of life. And up from the, up from the grave, Jesus Christ arose. Yeah, we're talking about dying in Christ. Now, you got two choices tonight, and hopefully everybody in this room has already made the choice. But there is actually two choices for every man or every woman. You can die in your sin, or you can die in Christ. Oh, you're going to die. If the, Lord, if the Lord doesn't come, you are going to die. Well, bless God, I believe I can live to be 120 years old because that was promised to me. Yeah, and you're going to die after you're 121. If you live that long, you're going to die. Well, I don't have to die. I'll just choose to die. Well, you're an idiot. If you just choose to die, you're crazy. Don't preach to me. You're nuts. Hello? The truth is, we're going to die. If the Lord comes, we're not going to die. I like that. I love that. If the Lord comes tonight, we're not going to die. Woo! We're not going to die. But if he does, does not come, we're still not going to die. Our body is going to be released. We're going to have rest. We're going to rest from our labor. And our works will follow us. So if he doesn't come, we're going to die. Now, where are you going to die? I'm not talking about the hospital bed. I'm not talking about a wrecked car. I'm not talking about a bed of affliction. I'm talking about where are you going to die? Are you going to die in Christ? Or are you going to die in sin? That's the two choices. If you die in sin, you have no use for the church. If you die in sin, church is not important to you. If you die in sin, the Bible's not important to you. If you die in sin, skipping church doesn't matter to you. If you die in sin, it's not really important. You're too busy making a living. The economy is important to you, just like the economy will be important to those who take the mark of the beast. If you're, if you're in sin... You're going to use bad language. If you're in sin, you're going to do bad, bad things. If you're in sin, you're going to think bad thoughts. If you're in sin, you're going to do things you shouldn't do. And if you die that way, you're going to hell. That kicked back like a sawed-off shotgun. If you die that way, you're going to hell. You say, yeah, but preacher, you shouldn't talk. Can you, can, you, can, you, can, you go to, can you go to church and be a good Christian? Well, let me, let me explain something to you. Can you eat food out of a pot that ain't been washed? Sure, you can eat food out of the pot. Why are you going to get poisoned? And if you think you don't need to go to church, you can still be a great Christian. First of all, I've never found a great Christian that don't go to church, unless they're in a nursing home. Unless they can't go to church. I've never found a good Christian don't go to church. 
found a bunch of people that had an ego that thought that they are the church. And I'm thinking, man, you're fat, but you're not that fat. <laughs> church is not one person. Church is a group of people. A gathering of believers. Amen? Amen. Getting rough around here. If you die in your sin, you're going you're gonna to go to hell. You're going to burn hell. You're going to split hell wide open. You're going to die and burn forever. The Bible says in the 14th chapter, this chapter we're preaching on, the smoke of this torment shall ascend up forever and ever, and they'll be without rest day or night. So you can choose to die in sin, busy making a living, busy struggling with, you know, we talked about it, got those problems and got them sorrows. And we talked about the fact labor and you're laboring to get through life, and you're laboring to make it through life, and there's storms in life, trials in life, and you're laboring alone without Christ. You're going to go to hell without Christ. You've got to die in Christ. Those who die in Christ. So you're going to choose to die in sin, or you can choose to die in Christ. If you die in Christ, you're going to have a deep love for the Scriptures. If you die in Christ, you're going to have a desire to serve God. If you die in Christ, you're going to feel really bad when you sin. Notice I didn't say if you die in Christ, you won't sin. I said if you die in Christ, you'll feel really bad if you do sin. You will, be, you will have contrition in your heart. If you die in Christ, it does matter how you live. It does matter where you go. It does matter how you present yourself if you die in Christ. And we want to live the best life we can live. And I want to live the best life I can live. But I promise you the best way to know if you're in Christ, you do something wrong and see if the Holy Ghost don't show up and say, ah, 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 ah. And you don't make excuses for it. You just say, okay, Lord, I'm sorry. And you ask God for forgiveness, and then you learn to not do that anymore. That's the leadership of the Spirit of God. Amen? So tonight, only two places to die. You're going to die. And you're either going to die in Christ or you're going to die in sin. And I'm choosing to die in Christ. I didn't say I'm going to die. Christ is perfect. I'm not. So I'm going to die in perfection. I'm going to die in a perfect Christ. I'm going to die in a perfect blood. I'm going to die in a perfect salvation. I'm going to die in a perfect God. I'm going to die in a perfect love for me. I'm going to die in a perfect sanctification, a perfect redemption. I'm not perfect, but I'm going to die in that place because God's going to work it out so that I can live for him and, and honor him. Amen? I refuse to die in sin. Stand with me. <coughs> I'm glad you came tonight. Amen. Wow, praise the Lord. We had two people, glad they came. Awesome. I feel good. I told you Josh is the mean one. I'm the gentle, kind, sweet. I'm the young looking one. I'm the young skinny one. He's the old fat one. All in the eyes of the beholder. Amen. You stand in front of the mirror and you go, man, you're losing some weight. And then you stand like this and say, yeah, stand this way again. Josh did some awesome preaching. Appreciate him filling in for me. But I want to say to everybody in this room, there's a dif difference between labor and your works. And so many times people try to get them together. And that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the labor of this world. God wants to give you rest from your labor and your works will follow you. That's a great lesson, dying in the Lord. Altars open, we'd like to invite you to come.